It was at this moment that he knew. He... Ah! Greetings, fellow Earthlings, and welcome to the outdoors. With the engine and the transmission out of the car, the tiny garage really is full, and so this seemed like a good option. Now, for those of you who are just joining us, I bought this Porsche pre-broken on Craigslist, and over the last few months, with your help, I've been able to uh, rebuild the engine and get it running again for about 300 miles until I broke the transmission. Now, in episode 25, we learnt about the evil spectre that is bore scoring, and in episode 30, we learnt about the famous or infamous IMS bearing, and I think after this experience, we need to add the transmission to the list of major issues that you need to be aware of. Breaking this transmission really has brought home to me how expensive it is to fix any transmission problems, especially on these cars. For a start, many regular transmission repair companies won't even touch the Porsche transmission. And those specialists that do are few and far between, and often they won't fix your transmission, they won't even open it up unless they get to rebuild the whole thing so they can warranty the work. And that is often between four and $8,000. And that's why the common recommendation people give if you have some transmission problems is to replace your old transmission with a fully functional used one. Now a used transmission is easily $3,000 or more and they're becoming fewer and further between. And so that's why you need to be very aware of the possible expenses and problems you can have if you have any transmission issues. So what happened to my perfectly functional transmission? Well, the advice that I've got from all of you folks through the comments section and other social media has really been essential to me being able to complete the engine. And I really appreciate all the fantastic advice that I've got. But that's not to say that all the advice was good. I remember back right before I was putting the pistons back into the uh, cylinder block, a group of you were getting grumpy with me because I wasn't honing the cylinders. And now at the time, I didn't even know what honing was. But I know now that if you hone the cylinders on a Porsche cylinder block, you ruin it. And it's at least $6,000 to fix it. And so thankfully, I didn't do that. But in this case, a viewer was extremely convinced that he could reset my transmission and my gear shifter and make it all work a little bit better if I undid this little plug on the transmission. Now it turned out that that was bad advice. Here we are looking on the passenger side of the transmission and it was that little plug right there that I undid. Don't do that. We're going to use my self-inflicted nightmare as an opportunity to learn how the transmission works. So let's take a look back at that picture again. We really have two things going on on the outside. We do have the selector lever, the small one, and then we have the external shift lever, the big one. Let's see what the gear shifter does then. We're gonna pull it into neutral, and you'll see that the little lever and the big lever do two different things. Little lever does left and right, and the big lever does backwards and forwards, and that's important. You'll also notice that there's a detent, a spring holding it against me that it wants to always go back into the middle, into like the third and fourth area. And then to get into reverse, I have to push extra hard to get it to go into reverse. So then you can see what's happening is the little lever is lining it up for the gears. And then when you push it backwards and forwards, the big lever is actually pushing it into the gear. And when we look inside the transmission, hopefully that will make even more sense. It was at this moment that he knew. So after I had undone that bolt, here's what was wrong. It just wouldn't go into reverse. That small lever wouldn't go back far enough, whatever that means. This transmission snafu, of course, was the main reason the engine had to come out. There's a lot more detail on how to do this in episodes 7, 8 and 9. This is from episode 63, when we had some help from Kelsey. Thank you, Kelsey. Hold on, what's the dog doing? Oh yeah, subscribe now. Delta says thank you. Once you get the engine out, then you have to get the transmission off it. 
This actually is pretty easy. You can see much more details in episode 10. However, if you've got a 16 mil, a couple of 15s, and a 10 millimeter triple square, you're golden. Next then, we're into pretty unknown territory. These are a bunch of 13s all the way around the nose cone. All my knowledge here comes from this YouTube series from Scott90FZR. Thank you, Scott, I presume. Unfortunately, Scott only published the teardown. He did not publish anything about how to put it back together. So there will be some improvisation today, folks. I'm using a little bit of encouragement to get the nose cone to start moving. And then using those plastic trim tools to get a little bit more space in there again. I'm taking out this plug because Scott does that in his video. And I know now that it's not possible to take off the nose cone unless you remove this spring-loaded detent that allows the large lever to move ever so slightly further than it normally would. And it allows it to come free of the mechanism inside. That has a little roller bearing on it that fits in the grooves on the inside of the lever. This was all about wiggling, but certainly you want to try to pull the nose cone towards the large lever so that you can free up that wheel and be careful of that wheel on the inside. Nothing is holding that in place. I lost mine under a shelf before I even knew of its existence. All right, first operation is to sort of see what's in there and see if I can, oh my gosh, there it is. That is at least a spring. I'm sort of expecting that there is a ball bearing in there somewhere too. I'm not sure where that goes, but it must be what I messed with, obviously. Next thing, we're gonna grab that magnet, which does have some you know, metal shavings on it. I don't know if it's excessive or not, but that allows us to poke around here and try to see if there is any ball bearings or other springs or anything. I don't even know what to expect. Now that fluid does go through a hole, probably multiple holes, back into the differential. They share the same fluid. And so now I'm pouring it out there in a way that I should be able to see if anything comes out. And then sticking a boroscope down all the holes to see if I can see anything, which there wasn't really anything to see. This is the area that I broke and thankfully it was pretty easy to see what happened. That lever has those shapes in it that gives the gear shifter the desire to be in neutral and make it more difficult to get it into reverse because it's pushing against that spring. And that spring got free when I undid the plug because that made the lever loose enough that it could slip by. Oops. So I was able to get the spring back in, I put the lever back in position. And then that little knob that I had pulled out holds that lever square so that that spring won't move. And so if you do that, don't ever do that. But you do have to open the transmission to fix it. You can see there how when the selector lever moves backwards and forwards, it makes that shift finger rotate. And well, hey, that's it. I fixed my own mess up. Hit the notification bell, it's up there. Yes, please. So now we need to put it back together, but first we're gonna clean it. I wrapped everything up just, I wasn't sure how long anything was gonna take and I didn't want anything else getting into the mechanism. So we're gonna start with the nose cone. That's that little wheel that is part of the uh, external selector lever. And just cleaning the top there. Obviously that's the cleaner part. The nose cone is upside down right now. It gives you an idea of sort of the sludge that was in there. So this is a good opportunity to clean that up. I'm also going to clean up the mating surfaces with Scotch-Brite and brake cleaner. Then we're going to use some flange sealant on that when the time comes. And I got this stuff, Lubra plate, because it says on there that you can use it to rebuild engines and transmissions. And this is that magnet that's a little furry with some metal. I don't know if that's normal or not, but it didn't take very much to clean it up. There we go, lovely, ready to go back in. Now, once that was pretty much cleaned, I blew everything out with the compressed air and then put the detent in. Just put this in temporarily here just so you can see what it does from the inside, you know, because this has to stay off until you've got the nose cone in place. So we wouldn't be able to see it then. 
So then we put the spring in there. It's going to mock it up so it kind of works. Starting off with the gear lever back in the 246 position, there's neutral. Then gear lever forward in the 1, 3, or 5 position, and then back to neutral. Curving that up as well while we work on the main transmission y bit. Here we're just cleaning it up again with the usual recipe of brake cleaner and Scotch Bright pad. Just going over all the various rods and mechanisms with an allegedly lint free cloth just to clean up whatever I can see. Oh dear, I see something. Oh no. Oh no, that's my worried face. Where did that come from? It was just sitting there on the metal. I'm looking around. So that's the shift finger I'm messing with and that can move up and down. Oh, and then I see it. And that's not the only one that's missing. Thankfully, I was able to poke around and I found all four of those little buggers. Now, if you look back here, right after we took the nose cone off, you can see how they're right on the edge of being able to fall out. No! And there's nothing holding them in. Um, they are just held in by being in that confined space. So here's my plan. I used that Lubra plate as a glue. Felt like that game of operation, you know, with the buzzer. And then with lots of patience, my heart was in my throat throughout this whole process. Have you ever like tried to fix something and then completely made it worse? Well, that's where I'm at right now. Okay, proof of concept. One, done. Here's the other side, and I'll spare you the other ones. We did manage to get all four of those little buggers in place. You can see there how that mechanism on the small lever can rotate that shift rod. Okay, now that we have saved ourselves from another self-inflicted nightmare, let's see how this transmission works. That is the input shaft that is bringing power from the engine that would be sort of laying on the floor on its exhaust tips. And then on the other side is the output shaft that goes to the wheels. I wasn't sure what to expect when I opened the transmission. I kind of thought power would come in one end and go out the other, but they fold it around in like a U shape. Now here's an important thing that I'd actually heard of before. This is one of the shift forks, though I would admit it does not look very forkish. And uh, this, from the orientation that we're looking at it, if it moves up or down, it can click in and select one of two gears. Therefore, if you put the gear shifter straight forward from the neutral position, that's gonna pull this fork down and that will cause the third gear mechanism to lock onto the input shaft which will then carry power over to the output shaft and drive the wheels. When you pull back on the gear shifter, it's gonna push up on that fork and engage the fourth gear and make it turn with the input shaft, which will then drive that fourth gear on the output shaft and make the wheels turn again. Now we're looking on the other side, and that's the output shaft we're looking at, and we have these shift rods here. And those shift rods are connected to the shift forks. And so if you move the shift rod, you move the shift forks. And down the bottom here is the thing that does the moving. That's the internal shift rod and the internal shift finger that do all the work. When you move the gear shifter left and right, what you're doing is moving that little lever backwards and forwards, which in turn is rotating that shift finger and allowing it to slot into those cutouts on the shift rods. Whichever one it slots into, it can grab and move. It's then the large lever that moves that whole mechanism up and down and engages the gears using that spool of thread looking object on the right hand side of the screen. I would like if you would hit the like button. Okay, let's try to get this thing back together without breaking anything else. That's the magnet, just goes back in, nothing really holds it. 
using that compressed air quite a lot to get rid of the, all the little bits of fur from that lint-free towel. Here we go with that lubra plate. I'm just kind of giving every surface a little bit of lubrication just to help it on its way until whatever fluid needs to get to where it needs to go. Okay, time to put the nose cone on. What we're trying to do is line up the tops of all of those shift rods with the holes that are in the top of the nose cone itself. Those right there. That one in particular is where the shifter rod goes. What I've been doing is using this piece of wire here because it doesn't quite line up. And so I put the nose cone on and use that piece of wire to kind of pull the rod towards me a little bit. And then I'm using the boroscope camera to look up there and see how close I am to lining everything up. Now, this is cut down to a few minutes, but I spent probably six hours putting this on and off and on and off, sort of learning what I could and couldn't do. Because there are no instructions that I know of that tell you how to do this. So you can see there the other part of it is we're trying to line up that wheel on the big lever with that spool of thread looking thing that is what allows the big lever to uh, move the shift rod up and down. And so you have to get it all low enough that it will then slot sideways into that position. And I just couldn't get it to go low enough. <laughs> so lining everything up each time, having a look, see what's up. And then sometimes getting further than others, but never quite getting there. This is a little section of that six hour session. I promise, much editing involved. So I got it pretty close, and it's sort of ready like it would switch over and slot into that spool of thread thing. But it wouldn't because of that. Somehow, through my shenanigans getting the nose cone on, I managed to knock one of the bearings out of this bearing race on the output shaft. I set these vice grips to the size of the tightest bearing on that race, and then went around and I squeezed them all so they all became the same tightness and that seemed to fix it. Here's the answer, folks. You need two people. Thankfully, my daughter was willing to help me for a few minutes, and that was the magic, because that allows you to get the nose cone down into position perfectly straight, and that just makes everything line up properly, and makes it much easier. And then lots of shimmying, and it was in. Unbelievable. Then what I did was I cleaned up all the edges really good, and held a little bit of space there while I filled it with that flange sealant. I didn't have any guidance on what these 13 mils should be torqued to. Because they're 13 mils, I felt they could be as low as 23 Newton meters, maybe as high as 45 Newton meters. So I went with 30 Newton meters. And then putting back in the detent mechanism for the large lever. A little bit of blue thread locker on that one. 30 newton meters on that plug, and that's it. And then all of a sudden, it began to work perfectly. It feels good. Next thing, before we put it back in the car, I'm going to fill it with fresh fluid. We're using this Liquid Molly 7590 the good stuff. The capacity is 2.7 liters. It took just under two liters to fill it back up. There was still some fluid left in the differential. So this could be controversial. In some of the non-Porsche books that I read, they said that I should fill up the transmission fluid until it flows out of the hole. Whereas in this one particular document that one of you guys sent me that says the Carrera six-speed transmission should be filled to 11 millimeters below the fill hole. So I made this little paperclip contraption to achieve that. But let me know in the comments what you think. Should I fill it till it flows out of the hole? Or is it correct to have it be 11 millimeters below the fill hole? So there it is, it's back together. It looks like a transmission again, and it kind of feels to me at least that it works properly. But like I said, I didn't have any instructions on how to put it back together. And so fingers crossed, it is correct because we're not gonna find out if it is right until we put the transmission back onto the engine and put the engine back into the car. Now, unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. Thank you very much for watching. Till next time.